Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for our 50th anniversary virtual celebration for the Sarasota Dolphin Research Program. We've got a lot in store for you tonight. We're going to be going into world of electronics that I've not entered before. Hopefully it's all going to come together with the wizardry of the production company that's been working with us. So enjoy what's coming. We're going to start out first with an introduction by Stuart Straw, the president and CEO of the Chicago Zoological Society. Stuart, are you there? Yes, I am, Randy. Thanks so much uh, for this introduction. You know, this is a, this is a remarkable uh, experience for me. Uh, working with you guys now for 17 years. Uh, the Sarasota Dolphin Research Program is a, we feel it is a, a, as, as much of a partnership as it is a program. Uh, you all have been doing these things for 50 years uh, down there in, in Sarasota. And uh, as a former field biologist uh, who only was, you know, did, did programs for like 10 years and things like that, having a longitudinal study of a marine mammal or of a mammal kind uh, for 50 years is remarkable. Uh, to have it be a marine mammal uh, is with all the issues of uh, animals in water and trying to find them and everything else is truly extraordinary. Um, I've been at the Brookfield Zoo as CEO following Dr. George Rabb for uh, now 17 years. And that time, uh, my interactions with Randy and his team and with all the many collaborators of the Sarasota Dolphin Research Program have been uh, over the top in terms of how uh, their experiences collectively, far beyond our staff and far beyond our collaboration, uh, have, uh, have acquired a huge database on dolphins. Uh, and how that impacts uh, our work with dolphins under professional care as well. So I hope everybody uh, enjoys the program as a lot of the collaborators and staff will share their experiences. And uh, now here's the director of the uh, Chicago Zoological Society Sarasota Dolphin Research Program, who of course uh, needs no introduction because he is Randy Wells, the infinitely famous uh, director of this program. Randy? I thought you were going with infamous there for a minute, Stuart. Thanks for the introduction, and uh, we'll be talking to Stuart a little bit later on. So today, we're here to talk about dolphins and what we've learned about them over the past 50 years. Back when I was growing up, and many of you are of an age where you were able to learn about dolphins the first time from things like movies, television programs, and books that were out. There weren't that many. And I don't even want to think about trying to sing for you the Flipper theme song. I'm sure you all can hear it in your own minds anyway from your own experience. You don't want to hear me sing. But we learned a lot. Uh, oh, there it is in the background. Um, so we have learned a lot during that time, but it was a lot about what we wanted to know about the animals, what we thought that they were doing, not really what they were doing. And so the age of really learning about wild dolphins came about starting in the 70s with a variety of projects that have happened in a number of places. Instead of Flipper, we've learned to call them by a variety of other names, Nellie, Ginger, Noah, FB54, and others. We've gotten to know the dolphins of Sarasota Bay pretty well over the past 50 years. The montage of fins off to the right is 50 for 50. Each of those dolphins was born in one of the years of the program in order. So we've been able to keep track of these animals over the years, but it all started on a particular day back in 1970, October 3rd, 1970, when Blair Irvine and Robert Corbin went into the field for the first time and put the first tags on Sarasota Bay bottlenose dolphins, helping us to go down the path of learning about these animals and their ranging patterns. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the people more than the dolphins. We had hoped to have a public science symposium at New College of Florida to share our findings about Sarasota's dolphins, but we had to postpone this due to COVID. We will be doing it. We'll let you know when the date comes up for that. Today, we're gonna to concentrate on the people who've made this possible, the founders, the staff, the volunteers, the students, the collaborators, and the supporters. We can't name everyone. There have been literally thousands of people who have worked with us over the past 50 years. 
but know that you've had an important role and you have been much appreciated for anything that you've done. So specifically today, we're gonna to be going through a, a couple of different items. First of all, you're gonna be hearing from colleagues from around the world, including many of them as international conservation leaders. And they're gonna talk about the SDRP, the Sarasota Dolphin Research Program, and what it's meant to them. We're gonna hear from the program founders, Blair Irvine and Michael Scott, who will talk a little bit about the history of the program. We're gonna be introducing you to our staff who will in turn introduce you to the volunteers, our grad students, our interns, our trainees, and describe something of our history of scientific publication. We'll recognize our leading supporters, those folks that have made it possible for us to continue to do the work that we're doing. We'll update you on Sarasota's dolphins. As I said before, we're not gonna be doing a lot on the science of the dolphins today. That will happen at the in-person symposium, but we would be remiss if we didn't at least give you a little bit of an update. You'll hear thoughts about where we go from here, and that's when Stuart will come back in again. And then finally, we'll have time for questions and answers. So we're going to be going through these various topics. If you have questions, go ahead and send them in, and we'll have staff that'll be collating them and presenting them to us for the answering session at the end. I'm Ralph Pylon. I volunteered with the SDRP for 30 years and currently have the privilege of serving as the president of the Dolphin Biology Research Institute, the Sarasota-based not-for-profit created in 1982 to ensure the continuation of long-term dolphin conservation research efforts involving Sarasota's bottlenose dolphins. I was working at the Chicago Zoological Society's Brookfield Zoo in 1989 when the partnership between CZS and the SDRP began. We need the real-world science performed by the SDRP. We need its biological discoveries to help guide our decisions impacting the sustainability of our very challenging world. And we need the next generation of scientists currently being shaped by the SDRP. Happy birthday, happy 50th birthday, Sarasota Dolphin Program. Um, I, Randy, I'd love to be there with you now. Uh, unfortunately, I would have to limit myself to send you this uh, greetings from uh, my beloved island of Patmos in Greece. Um, I, it is a long time uh, since we started working together. As you remember, we were in Hawaii more than 40 years ago working with Lou Herman on humpback whales. And uh, that's how we started. Um, in the years to follow, uh, you've done incredible work uh, with dolphins. <clears throat> um, this is the uh, longest time that anyone has followed uh, individual dolphins throughout their lives. And um, uh, hundreds of uh, colleagues and other researchers and scientists and young people have uh, taken so much inspiration from your work. You're being very determined, very uh, hard-headed, uh, never give up, continue, and you did the right thing. One of the things that I uh, very much like uh, of the insight that your research has been providing uh, everybody, including me, is that um, um, your work has transformed uh, the concept of working, um, studying a dolphin population, uh, which is something uh, that doesn't have any uh, tangible substance uh, with working with individual dolphins. And I think following the uh, single dolphins throughout their lives, throughout their problems, throughout their joys and successes, and mating and offspring, death, um, disease um, is shedding an incredibly important light on the lives of these animals. Yes, we want to do something for the species, we want to do something for the population that makes full ecological sense, but what we really want, and I think what I really want, is to make sure that I understand their individual lives and um, make sure that their lives is uh, in tune with what they have evolved in and with um, so much um, 
has been changed by us uh, for the worse, by us humans. So this is really, to me, uh, the, the, the main sense of what you've been doing. You've been doing great science, great um, health um, oriented uh, investigations, um, everything you want, but really you have shed light on the importance of um, taking care of the individual lives of dolphins. Thank you so much and happy birthday again. Thank you, Ralph and Giuseppe. It's great to be able to work with such wonderful people from around the world and for so many years. What I'd like to do now is take us into a bit of the history of the program. And for that, we're fortunate enough to have accounts from two of the program's founders. We'll hear first from Blair Irvine, the guy who got us started, and Michael Scott, the guy who kept us going once we got started, who will tell us a little bit about their perspectives from the historical side and the developmental side of the techniques that we have. And oh, by the way, a shout out to Jay and Barb for checking in. You all take care. We'll be right back. Greetings. It's a pleasure to be with you today. In 1970, this program started with a simple question. Where do dolphins live? Are they local? Are they regional? Or do they just keep swimming around? At the time, I worked at Moat Marine Laboratory, and I had no background in science. I was training dolphins to attack sharks. With me, was an unpaid assistant, 16-year-old Randy Wells, a high school student. He was a full participant in the project. Coincidentally, at that time, I received some tags from Bill Evans in the West Coast for dolphins, and Robert Corbin, a local dolphin collector, agreed to let me tag dolphins he was about to release if I worked as an unpaid crew. So, 50 years ago today, I went out with Corbin for the first time. There were three of us total. It's a nice looking tag, but it didn't actually last long in the dolphin. Randy came along on trips soon after. These were opportunistic taggings. It was Corbin's choice. Randy and I tagged the animals that he caught prior that he caught and was going to release. We used freeze brands to first test on near shore, near shore dolphins. And I want to pause briefly to give you a perspective of what it must have been like. Those of you who have been involved know that capturing dolphins is much easier if you have multiple boats and people in a very big net. Now mentally, erase most of the people in this photo. In 1970 to 71, we had three to four people, including young Randy. Sometimes Randy and I were the only crew. It seems crazy to think about now, but it worked. We identified year-round dolphins, as residents, and a possible so social structure. Jump ahead now, four years. In 1974, the U.S. Marine Mammal Commission gave me a contract to study and radio tag wild dolphins. Luckily, I met Michael Scott. I lured him from a promising Ph.D. program to a dead-end half-time job studying wild dolphins in Sarasota. Randy was in college at the time, but he was also wanting to be involved. It's important to note that we had no manual or advisors on what we were trying to do. It had not been done before. So I bought a boat and a used tower and a capture net. And we felt rich in resources. We had three boats. Some, sometimes we had six as many as 12 people, all volunteers, of course. We could tag and release as many dolphins as we could catch. We used radio and visual tags. Often they were remodels of remodels, and later they proved to be unnecessary. Michael developed boat survey routes, and he saw a lot of identifiable dolphins. We had to invent data sheets, and we had to invent definitions. It led to long discussions. How do you define a group of dolphins? By proximity or activity or... And how do you define those terms, proximity and activity, when you're talking about dolphins? These sightings raised new questions about ecology and behavior and social structure. We realized we were in a natural laboratory. The 18-month study set the stage for the future we are celebrating today. And the rest is history.
I began volunteering for the Sarasota Dolphin Research Project in the three dolphin ears, Blair, Michael, and Randy, a little over 40 years ago. There are so many aspects of this work that are important, but what really stands out to me was how pioneering it was as a longitudinal study, one that incorporates behavioral ecology, reproduction, individual and population health, as well as environmental and ecological aspects. The other thing that stands out to me, it has not only been a long-term study of dolphins, but it's also about the incredible people who have been part of this research team. From this project, there have been deep, lifelong friendships created, lives changed, and careers launched. So Randy, Blair, and Michael, just look at what you guys started. Who could have imagined out there on Sarasota Bay 50 years ago? The Sarasota Dolphin Research Program and the Marine Mammal Commission. I've been working happily together since a 1975 grant for a study of the activities and movements of the Atlantic bottlenose dolphin, Perseops truncatus, including an evaluation of tagging technologies. Recently, we've worked together on vaquitas and to train Cambodian Mekong River dolphin researchers. You have trained and been a friend to a lot of us and worked on all aspects of dolphin research and conservation. Congratulations on your 50th from, from all of us, all of us at the Marine here Mammal at the Marine Mammal Commission. This is on behalf of myself and our beloved colleague, Nelio Barros. We both have had the wonderful opportunity to work closely with the Sarasota Dolphin Research Program since the 1980s. Throughout this time, it has been both rewarding and a major part of my lab's research. Randy and I, first through his capture release program and more recently the biopsy program, have evaluated over 200 paternal contributions to this special resident community of dolphins. This contribution has been a highlight of my career and the friendship that Randy has consistently extended has meant so much. Thank you, Randy. Hi, I'm Leila Saig. I was fresh out of college way back in 1986 when I went to Sarasota for the first time. What an amazing experience to start graduate school with. The Sarasota Dolphin Research Program is truly a model of how a field project should be run and has enabled us to carry out studies of dolphin communication that are not possible anywhere else. We studied aspects of their communication, such as whistle structure, function, perception, development, and stability. I look forward to more collaborations with SDRP in the future. Happy anniversary, SDRP. Hi, I'm James Thorson, and I first started working with Randy Wells and SDRP as an Earthwatch volunteer back in 1986. And I'm sure plenty of people have mentioned how important SDRP has been to the field of marine science. But I'd like to take a couple seconds to mention how important it's been to people. In my 30 plus years working with Randy and SCRP in Florida, in Argentina, in Brazil, I've seen dozens of marine biologists launch their careers or advance them. And just as remarkably, SDRP has given so many of us, non-professional biologists like myself, the opportunity to participate and contribute to marine research. So on behalf of all of those you've helped and included along the way, thank you, Randy Wells and SDRP, for including us in your great adventure. We truly have been blessed to work with a lot of really good people, those that are still with us and, and those that, that have passed. We'll talk more about them as we go along. Right now, the Sarasota Dolphin Research Program is composed of a wonderful band of people. Some of them have worked with us for 30 years. Many of them have worked with us for more than 15 years. And so I'd like to take a little bit of time to go through each of them and show you a little bit about how they've changed over the years. And from the, the pictures at the bottom of this screen, you can see how we've had to change. The, Days of being able to put our team together on a boat and take a group picture have long gone this year. So we resort, resort to Zoom videos like everyone else and get our group pictures that way. And we're not immune from the latest fad. We had to throw in our picture identifying ourselves as part of Team Zisu as well. So the original trio of people that got this program going in the 70s, Blair Irvine, Randy Wells, and Michael Scott, this is us in 1976 with a dolphin known as Genie, who came on board and taught us that we had multiple generations of animals beyond just mothers and calves in Sarasota Bay. And we have changed over the years. Some would say for the, the better, others, I don't want to hear from you. So 
Going through our staff, now we're going to go in order of how long they've been with us. And Kim Bassos Hall started out as a grad student with our program, and she's been with us since 1990 as one of our research associates. Katie McHugh started out as an intern in 2000 and went through a graduate program, became a postdoc and a, post and a staff scientist with us, and we're very fortunate to have her on board as well. Jason Allen, when he's not having acoustics recorded, is our lab manager. He came on board in 2001. Aaron Barleycorn is our field coordinator, and he joined us in 2003. Elizabeth Barons McCabe heads up our fisheries research, and clearly she enjoys that a great deal. She joined us in 2004. We still have to teach her a little bit about when to come home. Christina Toms was an intern with us in 2006. She came back to do her graduate work and with a little bit of help from our team, and they came back on board as part of our staff as a research associate in the last couple of years. Carolyn Cush joined us in 2010. She is now the curator of the Gulf of Mexico Dolphin Identification System. It's a collaborative system for being able to keep track of individually identifiable dolphins around the entire Gulf of Mexico. She does an amazing job with that. Kristen Wilkinson started out as an intern in 2011. She went on to do both her master's and her PhD on Sarasota dolphins and their interactions with sharks. And now she's here as a postdoctoral scientist. Allison Honecker joined us in 2013. You can't keep her away from looking at dorsal fins. She thrives looking at dorsal fins of dolphins or scar patterns on manatees, which she perhaps prefers a little bit. I don't know why. Rennie Tyson Moore has been doing dolphin and whale work for many years. She joined our team in 2015 and is a staff scientist with us at this point. Jonathan Crossman joined us last year after a stint as an intern with our program. He came on board as a research assistant. And two of our graduate students that are currently working with us with support from Chicago Zoological Society, Teresa Ann Tatum Necker is at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She's working on fatty acids in dolphins. And Kylie DiMaggio has just come on board at the University of Florida working on a master's degree looking at uh, reproductive success in dolphins. And the program is built on people. There have been many people who have come before the ones or during the ones that I've talked to you about just, just now. We've had a lot of really wonderful people that have walked through our doors and gone out on our boats, stood in the water side by side with us over the years, and really helped to make it possible for us to get to where we are now. And to all of you folks, current and past staff, thank you very much. So one of the other aspects of the work that we do is training. Graduate students are a big part of our program. We've had about 85 graduate students that have taken advantage of our program either through obtaining data or samples, working in the field with us, or receiving guidance from us. And rather than your basic academic tree that you oftentimes see, we had a clever intern who came up with our academic kelp. So what you see here are the founders and the mentors of, of me down at the root ball. And then going up, we see the development of the branches from one university to the next and the students as leaves on each of those branches. Starting off with the Moss Landing Marine Laboratories in the far right-hand side, then going into Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, University of California, Santa Cruz, James Madison University, Duke University, University of Port Elizabeth, University of South Florida, Nova Southeastern University, University of Florida, Go Gators, Union Institute, University of Miami, Aberdeen, University of North Carolina, Wilmington, the uh, Catholica University down in Brazil, San Diego State University, University of Guelph, Western Illinois University, Florida State University, 
Medical University of South Carolina, Columbia University, UC Davis, University of St. Andrews, University of Central Florida, Murdoch University, Michigan State, Galway, and a couple of others up near the top that I can't read because it's too far away now. But anyway, these folks have gained something from our program. We've gained a lot from working with them and helping to move the field forward, helping to create conservation capacity around the world through this next generation of scientists. So we've, we've had a wonderful crew of volunteers. We can only show a few of them here. They come out and they help us with all kinds of work, whether it be survey work or health assessment work. They're there to do the things that need to be done, fishing work. And over the years, it's developed into quite a team. We're fortunate to have a lot of dedicated people here in the Sarasota area that can help with anything that we need to have done. If we have a rescue, we have the volunteer team available that we can call upon to go out and do what they can. We have people who help us from a distance, like Renee Burskoff, who helped greatly with putting together this program today. Heather Daskowitz has been with us for quite some time. Michael Duranko, Deb Fokier has become our lead vet in terms of coordinating all the rest of the veterinarians that work with us on our health assessments. Christy Fazioli started out as a, a graduate student and then became a volunteer who comes back and helps as we need them. Mark Fishman has been a tremendous help in the field, as has Sandra Fox. Ramsey Frangi, our resident skunk ape, has helped out in all aspects of the program for many years. John Hamilton has been working with us for decades, coming back each year to help for a couple of weeks. Jeff Holloway is local and has helped us out as needed on any of the work that needs to be done. Pete Hall, I met Pete in 1972 when he came on as an intern at Moat Marine Laboratory. And he's been there for us many times as we've gone into the field over the years. The picture on the right shows a dolphin named Misha. This is one of a pair of dolphins that were in a project where we experimentally returned these dolphins to Tampa Bay after two years that they spent engaged in research at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Pete's at the end of the arrow up on the top deck. But one thing to know is that this project itself, the Misha and Echo re uh, Reintroduction Project, will have its 30th anniversary this next week on the 6th. Renee Jones has helped us out tremendously, as has Kathy Marine over the years. Carol Mason, both Charlie and Fran Miracle have been a huge help to us. Laura Torelli, Monaco Torelli, has been with us for many years, since 1991, first as an Earthwatch volunteer, and then helping out seasonally with health assessment projects. Nigel has been there for us in all aspects of the program for many, many years. Norma, we truly rely on Norma for a lot of our field work. Chip helps us out with our uh, educational programs as well as coming out to help with health assessments. Brian Spaulding has been a big help with our health assessments over the years and helping to provide the food that keeps us going. Jeff Stover started in the 80s with us as an Earthwatch volunteer. He, and he brought his father to us to work with us as a volunteer and both of them have been of huge value to us over the years, being there for anything that needs to be done. Frank has been there since 2000, helping us out primarily in health assessment projects. And James, you've already gotten a hint of James. You're gonna see him more because he's been so engaged with our program over the years in all aspects of health assessment surveys, um, legal things, you name it, James is there and he's always got a joke. Bill Tiffin, a big help in, with our surveys. Martha Wells, I can't begin to say enough good things about what she's done to help the program since I first met her in 1998 and continues to just be an immense help for everything that we do around here. We also have a number of, of volunteers who are no longer with us, but if they were still around, they'd certainly be working with us. And Nelio Barros, you met through Debbie Duffield's video, an amazing soul who taught us more about what dolphins eat than anybody else on the face of the earth. And he enjoyed food as well, as can be seen from the, the produce and the chicken that he's carrying there, but just a truly excellent scientist and wonderful person. Charlie Key was a huge help with our survey work, especially in Sarasota Bay. Bill Scott, former vice president of Dolphin Biology Research Institute, a fellow who came on board as an Earthwatch volunteer back in the 90s and stayed with us as a volunteer for many, many years, helping us out in Sarasota and in other parts of the world, including Bermuda and Argentina. 
And then Gene Stover. As I mentioned before, he and his son Jeff have been an immense help. We're fortunate Jeff just moved back to the area and we hope to be able to work more with him and carry on Gene's legacy. Ruth DeLynn was there as part of the necropsy team at Moat. And she was engaged in a lot of activities that taught us about the biology of these animals from their carcasses, from their skeletons. And we're very thankful for everything that she and the rest of these volunteers have done for us over time. In addition to volunteers, we also have people that come through for shorter periods of time to learn from us, the trainees. And they take a variety of forms. And to talk to us about the volunteers, we have Dr. Katie McHugh. Katie, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. All right, well, great. Um, so, uh, thanks, Randy. Um, so as part of the Chicago Zoological Society's Conservation Education and Training Group, of course, training and capacity building for conservation are really a core part of our work. And personally, Randy said this a couple minutes ago, but I began my own involvement as an undergraduate intern 20 years ago um, and have benefited throughout my career from that initial connection with the SDRP. Um, now I coordinate our internship and training programs and it's one of the best parts of my job with this program helping to share what we've learned with the past over the past 50 years with new students and researchers from around the world and these folks come to the SDRP for training in our core research and analytical techniques those things built up over the long-term history of the program we're fortunate that we've worked with people from all across the globe. Nearly every continent is represented. On this map, you can see sort of a, a color ramp from, from green. We've only had one person from those countries up to red in the US. Of course, many of our trainees have come from there. But we have folks from all over the globe that have come joining us for our health assessments or for longer training periods of 10 weeks to many, many months. Um, they work with our photo ID programs, our prey and ecological sampling, even learning about behavioral monitoring and safe capture and release or rescue techniques that can be applied to other study sites, new studies, new species of conservation concern. And you'll hear from some of these folks in, in um, collaborators in a few minutes. Um, but I just wanted to say that this, this part of our program is really one of the things that I think makes us uh, a special and makes me really proud to be a, a part of it. Um, nearly 400 people have trained with us over the years and over 100 folks have come from other countries to learn about our health assessment techniques. Um, we've had 70 interns from outside the U.S. and 30 postgrads that have come to learn advanced techniques that they've been applied to studies elsewhere. And um, this is really how we help pay it forward. You know, what we learn in Sarasota can have um, something to teach us for, for other places and, and it's really a great part of, of the work. Um, support for these things has come from all sorts of people over the years, individuals, foundations, of course the Chicago Zoological Society. Um, we've also received some help from the Disney Conservation Fund and the Marine Mammal Commission and individuals who've gotten scholarships and Fulbrights and other things to help support their travel and living expenses. Um, most of what we do is through partnerships, and some of those U.S. partnerships have included collaborations with the National Science Foundation's Research Experiences for Undergraduates program, and more recently, locally here, the Cross College Alliance of um, local institutions has supported an environmental discovery um, awards program. Um, the intern that created the kelp forest diagram Randy showed you and uh, a little project I'm going to give you a preview of in a second, both came through this program. And these are designed to help support students that are of low income or are underrepresented in marine science and science in general, be able to receive the training they need to be able to advance in science careers and in conservation down the line. Um, so I guess, Randy, if you're the one with slides, <laughs> you want to advance? Um, okay, so here's a preview. Um, Randy mentioned we're going to give you some highlights on publication topics. So one of these um, Cross College Alliance interns from the summer created the following images um, to visualize our scientific publication topics over time. So each dolphin here is going to represent a different period of time in the long-term history of the program, and it's filled with words. These words are keywords representing the main topics covered in all of our research papers during that period of time, including the study species, location, and the focus of their research. The size of the words, so these are basically word clouds, the size of the word has to do with how frequently they were relevant in the publication. So the more times it showed up in a publication, the bigger the word is. 
And it's going to be way too overwhelming for you to get all of the details today, um, but these will be up on our revamped website and the underlying publications will be there as well. And we hope that the results of all this work will eventually be shown in our symposium that we hope to have down the line. But just look as they go through from decade to decade at how there's both continuity, so of course we have our wild bottlenose dolphins in Sarasota Bay over time, but also the growth in the breadth and the number of words, the types of things our program has been working on as the research and the collaboration network has developed in Sarasota Bay and beyond. So you see emerging research techniques like advancements in tagging and acoustics, emerging topics of concern come up, so things like adverse human interactions and red tides, and of course in our most recent decade, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill is well represented. Um, this is sort of the, the uh, short and, and quick way of, of summarizing everything that we've done, and so I hope that you'll be able to explore these more um, on the website when they get put up and appreciate just how much we've grown over time. That first 20 years was about 23 publications and 100 words. And by our most recent decade, we're up to uh, 130 publications and almost 400 keywords. Each time in this last one here, those bright green words are all the new ones that have shown up for the very first time that we've ever done anything related to that topic or that species or that location. Um, and so still, um, anyway, it's, it's a sort of a fun way of looking at it. Um, and I think that's it for me. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very Kate. much. You're welcome. I've been studying coastal dolphins in the Mediterranean for over 20 years. Throughout my career, the work conducted by the Sarasota Dolphin Research Program has been a constant reference and a source of inspiration. I've been lucky to visit the Sarasota Dolphin Research Program in 2017 and then again in 2019. Cetacean research and conservation could not be understood the way it is today without this project. A slightly less windy day here in Western Australia. My name is Dr. Lindsay Porter and I work for CMAR, a Hong Kong based entity that conducts research throughout Southeast Asia. I first met Dr. Randy Wells when he came to visit me in Scotland. We were organising the European Cetacean Society meeting in 1993 and Randy was our keynote speaker. He was inspirational and I took much delight then taking him out to see our Scottish bottlenose dolphins, which I have since learned, since learned are rather more robust than the beautiful little dolphins you research in Florida. Since our first meeting in Scotland, I subsequently moved to Asia, where I've had the great delight and privilege to work with Randy and the Sarasota Dolphin Research Programme team on various projects. Together we have worked on Taiwanese critically endangered Indo-Pacific humpback dolphins, we've provided management plans for our Hong Kong's Chinese white dolphin population and more recently we've been assisting our Cambodian colleagues with the long-term study of the Mekong River Irrawaddy dolphin. My favourite project with the Sarasota Dolphin Research Programme was to bring our Cambodian colleagues to Florida so that they could see what Randy's team did and the amazing work that can be done utilising these long-term studies of dolphin populations. It was an absolute privilege to spend time with the entire team in Sarasota and my Cambodian colleagues learned more I think in two weeks than they would have done in a year of corresponding online. Randy and his team are such wonderful, wonderful hosts and that to me is, was the, one of the pinnacles of my work and my time with Randy and his team. It's difficult to say exactly how much the research that Randy has conducted has contributed to conservation of small cetaceans worldwide. For me and my team, if ever we embark upon a new project, we always say to ourselves, has Randy already done this? And if so, he is who we go to for guidance and to make sure that we are doing the best science that we can. The reach of the team is truly, truly global and I say this to you from the other end of the world. Randy and team, keep on doing what you're doing and here's to another 50 years of productivity. Love you guys. Our first 
work with SDRP was designing and implementing Vaquita Conservation Protection and Recovery Program since we started in 2016. However, Randy was in the Upper Gulf many, many years ago to assess if we could catch vaquitas and, and bottlenose dolphins in the delta of the Colorado River. And the main impact, I think, it goes beyond Florida and the U.S. Examples are plenty among them. Research and conservation programs with Irrawaddy Dolphin, Baichi, Franciscan, and certainly Vaquita. The Sarasota Dolphin Research Program has provided a series of the recommendations to help address the challenges that are facing the current conservation and management of the Mekong River Dolphin, including the recommendation on fishery and law enforcement, population dynamics, behavior and ecology, education and outreach, necropsy program, tourism, hydropower dam development. This program has also built the capacity of the Mekong Dolphin team on photo identification database development and field-based experience in photo identification, behavior observation, and biopsy sampling through a providing a training. The capacity that the Cambodian team has received from the field trip has significantly improved the current conservation work in Cambodia. We have been working with the colleague at Sarasota Dolphin Research Program since 2009. The program has a strong capacity on monitoring of the bottom of dolphin population, biopsy sampling, investigation of mortality and behavior study, especially the study on life and reproductive history of individual dolphin. Hello, my name is Marta Kremer and I'm the coordinator of the Francis Kenner project in southern Brazil. Thank you, Randy Wells and all the SDRP team for your partnership in the capture, tagging, and releasing Francis Cannons in Babitonga Bay, as well as for the training opportunities for many Brazilians in Sarasota. This collaboration gives us the unique opportunity to understand the home range and the residence patterns of this critically endangered species, and to propose mitigation measures in environmental licensing process. Thank you for your essential work, and congratulations for your 50 years. All right. We truly have had a wonderful bunch of colleagues from around the world to work with. So the Sarasota Dolphin Research Program is made up of our staff, our volunteers, our students, our colleagues from around the world. And with all the best intentions and all the best brains thinking good thoughts about science, we wouldn't be able to do anything except for the support that we're getting to be able to do our research. We've had a number of lead supporters over the decades that have ensured that we've been able to keep the program going and expand it over time. I'd like to take a few minutes to call out each of these lead supporters. Prior to 1989, the Sarasota Dolphin Research Program was a merry band of just a couple of biologists, me, Blair, Michael, and a couple of our colleagues and friends. We built the program up from nothing at the very beginning. We build it up with blood, sweat, and tears. We typically didn't have salaries to do what we were doing. We did it because we cared about the animals. And we enjoyed working with the people that also had similar mindsets and wanted to get the same kind of work done. We're very thankful for all of those who gave to make things happen to create the first 20 years that brought the program to the level where it was something that the Chicago Zoological Society would want to consider as part of its research portfolio. Once we came on board with the Chicago Zoological Society in 1989, and they became responsible for the support of the program for the past 30 years, life got easier and it got harder because we could all of a sudden leverage even more work and bring on even more people. But it's been a wonderful relationship over the years. I can't say enough positive things about the Chicago Zoological Society and what they've done to make this program what it is today. A few other institutional supporters, Moat Marine Laboratory is where it all started. Dr. Perry Gilbert gave us the time off, me and Blair, to go out and do the initial tagging that let us know that dolphins were resident to the area. And today, we're fortunate to have our base of operations here at Moat Marine Laboratory. The Marine Mammal Commission, that merry band of folks that you saw in a video a little while ago, the commission gave us our first grant. Back in 1974, they brought us together again in Sarasota to be able to do tagging and to learn more about the residency patterns of these animals. NOAA has been a partner over the years. NOAA actually shares a birthday with us. They also turned 50 today. But over the years, they've been partners in terms of providing funding and also working with us to deal with conservation issues around the United States. 
We've gotten funding for research from Florida Institute of Oceanography. Earthwatch was one of our major sources of funding and people for the first few years of the program. We worked with them for 25 years from 1982 to 2006 and had a thousand Earthwatch volunteers that contributed their time and effort and funding to keep our research operations going. And over the years with the Dolphin license tag through Harbor Branch, we've been able to receive quite a bit of research funding to be able to continue various projects as well. In addition to the institutional supporters, we have foundation supporters. And I can't say enough good things about the Charles and Marjorie Varancic Foundation. They came to our rescue when things were pretty dire for being able to continue the program. For the past three years, going into our fourth year of a five-year grant now, they have been the primary funders of the bread and butter of what we do. The photographic identification surveys, the fish surveys, the basics that feed into the data set that then become available to everybody else working with us from around the world. And they've made a huge difference. The Bachelor Foundation has been there for us quite a bit as well in terms of helping with our operating expenses and making sure that we can continue our operations. The Moat Scientific Foundation, building on the legacy of William R. Moat, is a group that has come to our rescue with research funding for specific projects and also to help out when times have gotten tough as during the, the COVID pandemic where we've lost research projects and have had to come up with support to keep things going in other ways. And we're happy to carry on the legacy of Bill Moat. We are thankful to the Elizabeth Ordway Dunn Foundation, the Keynes Family Foundation, the Moeller Family Foundation, Morris Animal Foundation, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, and the National Marine Mammal Foundation for support that they've brought to the program over time. We have corporate supporters that have made a big difference for us as well. For more than two decades, the Disney Conservation Fund and its various iterations have provided incredible support for supporting student projects and research projects here in Sarasota Bay and elsewhere, down in Argentina as well, for example. Dolphin Quest has been responsible for supporting our health assessments since the mid-1990s, and we're extremely grateful to them for that and for their support in getting us to do work over in Bermuda to learn more about those deep water dolphins as well. Dolphin Connection, Georgia Aquarium, and Aura Inc. have also provided important support for us. Individuals. There's so much to say about individuals. There's a lot to say about the anonymous individuals, but they won't let me. I would love to be able to thank each of them publicly, but you guys know who you are and you chose to stay anonymous, so thank you. Those that are a bit more open um, include Ed Blair. Ed Blair has been working with us for decades, coming to us from the Chicago Zoological Society and working with us in the field for our health assessment projects, and we're extremely grateful to him for everything he's done for us over the years. Don and Lee Hamilton, keep us in wheels. Since the 1990s, they've been responsible for making sure that we have vehicles to tow our boats around, to move our team around, and also provided other levels of support to make sure that our operation can keep going. We are very grateful to Mr. and Mrs. Stephen Bent, James and Elizabeth Bramson, Marge Brumis, Allison and Rick Elfman, Ronnie and John Enander. Ronnie and John came to us in 1982, offering up their, their sailboat named Misty as a research base in Palmasola Bay if we wanted it. We went out with them, we had a great time, learned a lot about how much we all appreciate the environment around here, and it's been wonderful to interact with them ever since. Mr. and Mrs. John Gruby have been great supporters of the program, as have John and Nancy Hamill, and Corky Hamill as well. There are a lot of individual supporters. You see this guy cropping up in all kinds of slides this evening. Without Blair Irvine, none of this would have been possible. And he makes it possible not just from having gotten us started and helping to keep us going, but financially, he and his wife have also been strong supporters of the program over the years, and we are grateful. We also thank Diane Letter for her support here in the Sarasota area, Judy and Mike Mason, Ira and Ellen Morochnik, Bill Kunkler and his wife Susan Crown. Bill has been a supporter of our program over the years and just this past year, we received the donation of the vessel that you see here as the newest member of our research fleet. Elizabeth Moore has come to us in our times of need when we've had data or funding gaps in order to be able to continue to collect the data. She's been there for us and Elizabeth, thank you so much for everything that you've done. 
Rick and Nancy Moskovitz have been there for us as well. Rick took a chance with us, let us put in our first passive acoustic listening station from a citizen scientist dock up on Longboat Key that's developed into a network I'll talk about a little bit later. But he and, and Nancy have provided that locational support, um, encouragement, and financial support that have helped out greatly over the years. George and Jane Morgan. I met George Morgan in 1971 as a freshman at the University of South Florida. We were on the same dorm floor. Flash forward 40 years, he lives on my street. We get to know each other once again, and he becomes a member of our research team, our, our rescue team, and he donated one of the, the best boats we have in our survey fleet out there as well, aptly named the Martha Jane. Other individuals that have been helpful for our program over the years include Chotka and Anthony Ruggiero, Kelly Schuler, Mr. and Mrs. Jack Schaefer, Mr. and Mrs. Robert Shaw, Jacqueline Silvieri, Nancy and Joanne Grace Tamling and Tamling Schaefer, Mr. and Mrs. John Taylor, the Robert Stern family. The vessel that you see here is aptly named the Stern. It was donated to us and it's been a tremendous help during our health assessment projects. Bill and Sandra Scott have a special place in, in our program. You've heard me talk about Bill before as a volunteer. Um, and he was ever so much more than that. He was a, a dear friend, and we've spent many hours with Bill and Sandra over the years, and they've been supporters of the program in many, many ways, and we miss, we miss Bill tremendously. James Thorson. You can't miss James Thorson. He's there. He will talk to you anytime you want. He'll say good things about the program or anything else that's on his mind, and we're thankful for that. And then Fran and Jack Wells. Unfortunately, neither of them are with us anymore, but they are the original supporters of the program. They encouraged me. They gave us our base of operations in the early years to be able to put up research teams when they'd come down for capture release projects. They gave us space to dock our boats. They gave us space to park trucks and trailers, and they were there for us. They helped make the peanut butter sandwiches that fed the team that Blair talked about, and we're extremely grateful to them for what they've done over the years. So this is who the SDRP is. And, but we bring in a lot of colleagues from elsewhere with a lot of expertise. And much of that expertise that we've been able to count on over the years has been uh, from veterinarians and physiologists who fill in gaps in what our band of behavioral ecologists can do. Hi, my name is Cynthia Smith, and I'm the executive director of the National Marine Mammal Foundation in San Diego, California. I've been working with Randy and his team for a couple decades, but we really started working more closely together in 2011 on the Deepwater Horizon investigation. And over the last few years, I've had the great honor and privilege of working side by side with Randy and his crew on endangered species and more specifically, the Vaquita Porpoise Project and now the Francis Ghana Dolphin Project. So I'm here today to wish you all an amazing 50th anniversary. What a huge accomplishment. I wish I could be there in person to celebrate. But until then, cheers. Hi, my name is Andreas Fallman. I'm a comparative physiologist working for a research foundation in Valencia, Spain. For the last seven years, I've had the fortune to work with Randy Wells and his team both in Sarasota and also in Bermuda. My group study comparative physiology and we're specifically interested in understanding how the lungs work when the animals dive at depth. And this is important to be able to understand how climate change and changes in the water structure may affect these animals and their ability to forage and capture food. Hello everybody, my name is Ann Pabs. Hi, Bill McClellan. We are honored to help celebrate the 50th um, anniversary of the Sarasota Dolphin Research Program. Uh, we and our students and our colleagues were, have been involved with this program since, well, let's just say the last millennium. The great program has offered us critical insights into the health and the biology of not only these dolphins, but because of the wonderful collaborative spirit that you all bring to this program has helped us understand the biology of cetaceans worldwide. Thank you. I have a strong memory of being in Pomasola Bay Never quite sure why it was always 195 degrees when we were in there, though. Maybe that's why we just did didos outside of the bay, just to cool off. Anyway, congrats, Congratulations, Dr. Wells. Dr. Wells, and a great program and everybody involved. Bye. Hi, Randy and guys. Congratulations, Randy, on 50 years of 
Sarasota project. It's been a terrific run. This is Jay Sweeney. Uh, I joined uh, the project with Randy in 1984, uh, right at the beginning. And um, if I have to reflect back upon the project as a whole, uh, I'm proud as just can get as can can be with all the people that we've trained, Randy, all the young people that have come up and become scientists and veterinarians on their own. And um, they all came one time or another to the Sarasota project. So uh, I have lots of wonderful memories. Uh, we have had done a lot of good work. We've had some spin-off projects. Here we are, Bermuda project. And um, we have a lot to be proud of, and I really am. Thanks so much for everything. See you in June. Bye. Hello, my name is Forrest Townsend. I first became involved with the Sarasota Project in 1988 at the insistence of my good friend and mentor, Dr. Jay Sweeney. He said, you need to go down there and get involved in this project. So I flew in uh, in the winter of 1988 and was escorted to a, it was late in the evening, we escorted to a house called the Wimpy House. And not that it was Wimpy, but that was the owner's last name. But anyway, uh, I was put on a colon, a sleeping mattress and for sleeping and and uh, we had peanut butter and jelly and water for our lunch and we cooked our own food and uh, I was really uh, impressed with the volunteers and the doctors and the scientists uh, in this project and I really wanted to be part of it. Uh, anyway, so this went on for many, many years uh, and we were learning all the time. As we went along, we learned a whole lot about dolphin health and procedures and protocols we could do to learn more about them. It hit its climax with the Deepwater Horizon and the group came together and uh, it was a great project and congratulations to Randy and his staff for 50 years of excellent dolphin research. Thank you. Thanks so much folks for the, for the video shout outs. We really appreciate it. When we're talking about a dolphin research program, it seems like we should probably talk about the dolphins at least a bit. And so tonight, what I'm gonna do is give you a brief update of what's been going on in Sarasota. A lot of this isn't necessarily published yet. It's still being digested. It could, should be considered hypothetical or speculative in some cases, but it'll give you some idea of the directions we're going in with the research that's happening now. So back in the beginning, with the first publications that we had come out, there was not much known prior to when we started the work. People didn't know about ranging patterns of dolphins except from a few distinctive individuals that had been seen repeatedly in a few places. The abundance of the dolphins in Sarasota Bay wasn't really well known. We got a rough estimate in, from the 1970s that we published in 1981 of about 102 dolphins in Sarasota Bay as a starting point to be able to do the, the work that we've done since that time. Since the 1970s, We've engaged in a lot of detailed work looking at, into the social structure, the population biology, and the ecology of these animals. And while we were doing all that, we also got a better sense of what these animals are facing. We learned about the threats that they face, and we learned that these are concurrent and cumulative. We learned that the dolphins don't get a choice about which threat they're going to be facing at any given time. And so we'll talk about the, the basic science that we've learned about these dolphins when we have the face-to-face symposium. But for right now, because it's of greater urgency, we'll focus more on the conservation aspects of what these animals are dealing with. So there are a lot of different threats that they're facing. One of the more recent ones and one that's on the minds of the people here on the west coast of Florida is red tide. And with the most recent severe red tide from the summer of 2018 into 2019, we learned that they can have a lot of different effects than what we might have expected early on. They have complex ecological impacts. So for example, one of the things we learned was that when a red tide comes through and rays leave the area, stingrays and other kinds of rays are gone from the area, either from dying from the red tide or moving out of the area, we see an increase in the number of fresh shark bites on our dolphins. This past year, we've seen record numbers of shark bites on the dolphins in Sarasota Bay. And so in, go so in going backwards through time, we see that this is a pattern. When there's an abundance of rays, as we determine from the fishing sample, fish sampling that we do, there's not so many shark bites. 
when there are not very many rays, as happens after a red tide, we see an increase in shark bites. And given that rays are a major food item of some of the sharks in the area, such as the bull sharks, it would make sense that the sharks are looking for another food item to replace the, the rays, and dolphins come up on the list. The little graph up in the upper corner suggests that this might be having an impact on the smaller dolphins as well. What we find is that when the catches of rays are small, the percentage of the young of the year calves that are lost is high. And so one can, exp can suspect that a bite-sized morsel like a young of the year dolphin, a baby dolphin, wouldn't show up in the stranding record as a carcass. It would just be consumed. So while the brevitoxins themselves in the red tide may be an issue for some of the dolphins, the ecological impacts may be even more important, but we still need to pin this down and confirm it. These are just our speculations at this time. We've learned that red tides are not all alike. In 2005, 2006, we had a severe red tide along the west coast of Florida. The microorganism killed off more than 75% of the prey fish that are available to the dolphins. And as a result, we saw the dolphins interacting to a greater extent with anglers, trying to take fish from the ends of, of lines, whether it's bait or catch. And we saw an increase in mortalities as a result of that. With this more recent red tide, we saw an equally severe decline in the available fish for the dolphins to eat, but we didn't see the same level of increased interactions with humans and with anglers afterwards. And we attribute this, speculating again, we attribute it to a very rapid bounce back in the fish populations. By last summer, by the summer of 2019, we had record levels of fish that we were catching during our, our prey fish sampling. And so the differences in these red tides in terms of how long it takes for them to recover, the resilience of the, resiliency of the bay, are new things for us. We're learning about the, the breadth of ecological response and all the different factors that can feed into keeping these animals going and changing the levels of threats that they have to face. It also led us to develop new research techniques. Working with David Mann and Loggerhead Instruments, Inc. and folks at New College, we've developed a, an array, an acoustic array, where hydrophones are mounted around Sarasota Bay through the help of citizen scientists, people who provide their docks as a place where we can put these listening stations. The hydrophones, the underwater microphones, are out in the water, they pick up the sounds, and they transmit those sounds to the cloud. And we can remotely pick up those sounds and interpret them from one site or another. The map on the left shows the red stations that are in existence now, the green stations that are hopefully going into uh, existence in the near future. We have some information here from one of the stations about the time the red tide came into the area. And this is one up near the mouth of Palm Sola Bay. The spectrograms are the figures in the middle. And spectrograms are just a way of showing sound energy. Anytime you see a light line, it means that there's sound energy going out, something you could hear. And in the top graph from August 1st, what you see are a lot of vertical lines that go along with snapping shrimp and dolphin sounds like echolocation clicks. And at the bottom, there's solid purple along the bottom. And these are fish choruses. These are a lot of noisy fish out there. And the dolphins cue in on these noisy fish. One month later, you go to the middle spectrogram. You don't see nearly as much in the way of light lines. You see a couple of little bumps down at the bottom. It's one very lonely toadfish that has something to say. The red tide wiped out the rest of the sound making creatures from the first one. You go down a little bit further and seven months after the end of the red tide, you see more light, more indications of sound energy, indications that the bay is recovering. So this remote system of being able to collect these data all around the bay gives us yet another acoustic window into what's happening and a new tool for being able to evaluate the health of the ecosystem. But it does more, but wait, there's more. What we can also do with this is record the sounds that the dolphins produce. And the spectrogram in the upper right shows the signature whistles, an exchange of signature whistles between a mother and a calf. Signature whistles are individually specific sounds that were first described by David and Melba Caldwell back in the 60s, and something that was confirmed by scientists from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, University of St. Andrews, subsequently working with dolphins in Sarasota. In shorthand notation, we can say signature whistles serve as names. The dolphins use them to call to others by that name, or they give off their own name to let others know where they are. With these listening stations, we can record the whistles at those stations. They can be processed through an algorithm that a new college master's student developed, 
and pick out which dolphin that is. And if we can pick that same dolphin up at the next station down the line, we can actually track these animals remotely from them talking, which is pretty cool. And then we can add to that an environmental context of human interactions. We can record the sounds that are produced by boats and get a level of how much humans interact are interacting with these animals in terms of producing noise that can interfere with the lives of these animals. So it gives us a great deal of information about these animals. And it's all through the assistance of the citizen scientists, through the, the brain power of David Mann and putting the system together and the folks that work with him, and what we've learned over time in terms of how to, to understand what's going on in the local ecosystem. So over the years, one of the things that we focused on, oftentimes with the help of Disney Conservation Foundation or Fund, is human interactions. And this has been the specialty of, of Katie McHugh. But we've been monitoring the rate of human interactions in Sarasota Bay, and we've tried to come up with ways that we can try to mitigate this. Adverse inter human interactions with dolphins include such things as, as feeding dolphins, which is illegal or having dolphins in the vicinity when anglers are fishing and putting them at risk for being caught in fishing gear or entangled in fishing gear. We've seen in recent years that the proportion of sightings that contain human interactions has gone down. It hasn't gone away, but it's gone down. At the same time, we've engaged in quite a strong program of outreach, of educating the public, going to targeted outreach with stakeholders and explaining to them what the dolphins need and what they can do to try to reduce their impact on the animals. We can't say that what we've done has resulted in this increase. We'd certainly like to believe that it's had a role in that, but we can't say for certain that that's the reason. But in the bottom graph, you see that the number of individual dolphins that are engaging, that are adding to this interaction is declined over time as well. And we have to fight against the fact that these dolphins learn from one another. They learn to get food from people. They pass that along to the next generation, as you can see in the genealogy on the right-hand side, and to the next generation. And the outlines, the red outlines, are all indications of dolphins that engage in human interactions, and it's worked to their demise in some cases or led to serious injury. So it is still a problem. We'd like to think that it's a reducing problem that we can help to mitigate, but it hasn't gone away. We need to continue working. The manifestation of these behavioral indications comes when carcasses are recovered by Marine Laboratory Stranding Investigations Program. About a third of the dolphins that disappear from Sarasota Bay are recovered as carcasses. And these dolphins are examined closely by Gretchen Lovewell and her team at Moat. What they found over the years is that in recent years there's been a decline in the number of dolphins that have died as a result of human interactions. It's hard to actually put together a statistical trend in here, but the tendency has been for there to be fewer human interaction mortalities, the red lines, the red bars that you see here. And I would have left it at that until 2020, but we've had an uptick in 2020. We've had two dolphins die from fishing gear, we had one die from entanglement in a net, and we had one die from a boat strike. We don't know yet what that's all about, there certainly has been an increase in human activity on the water with the pandemic. It's one place people feel like they can go and get their outside exposure and, and get their yayas yeah out. But it may also be resulting in more pressure on the dolphin population as well. And we're going to have to just keep monitoring this and see if this resolves on its own as life returns to normal. But positive news, there are things that are improving for these dolphins. There are some long-term threats that appear to be diminishing for these dolphins. We've been monitoring some of the environmental contaminants, the legacy environmental contaminants like DDT and PCBs in these dolphins for many years. These chemicals were outlawed decades ago because they were so toxic and because they last in the environment for so long. But we seem to be seeing them moving through the environment, moving through the dolphins. The graph on the left is for our adult males, males that accumulate these contaminants in their fatty tissues, in their blubber, and have no real way of getting rid of them. But over time, the males that are left in the population have lower concentrations of these contaminants. They're not building up the huge levels that we saw earlier on in the, the research that we've done. Similarly, in looking at the females, we look at how their concentrations have been going by looking at their calves. We look at their two-year-old calves because those two-year-old calves are pretty much reflective of their mothers in that most of their growth has come from mother's milk. And what we see here is that there's been a decline in the PCBs in these calves as well. 
And these are all very positive signs and things that we're happy to be seeing out there in the population. Other happy news. We can look at the number of calves that are born into the Sarasota community. On average, we're seeing 15 calves per year born to our resident moms. Back in the 90s, it was only a little over nine calves a year that were born. We like that kind of a trend. And who doesn't like going out and seeing a baby dolphin during the calving season? A little bit of a nature note from research that's just being completed now. And then we're we'll going into a special volume that'll summarize the 50 years of research in our program. But Dr. Debbie Duffield from Portland State University, who you saw in one of the earlier videos, has been doing paternity analyses, the same kind of analyses that are done for humans, looking at blood samples and tissue samples from the males and the calves and the mothers, and figuring out which of the males are responsible for siring the offspring. Every one of the fathers is a deadbeat. Dads don't stick around and take care of the kids. The moms have to do that. But by looking at these samples from these animals, we can put the pieces back together again and figure out which male was there to make the difference in terms of helping to create that calf. And we've learned that there are 52 males in the community that have been responsible for siring the 205, or the, the, uh, many of these calves in the area. Not all of them were sired from dolphins from within the area, but some of the local males have been responsible for as many as seven or eight calves over the course of their lifetime. And these males are contributing through siring offspring when they're anywhere from 10 to 43 years of age. So it's a productive community. Things seem to be going reasonably well with many aspects of it. Harkening back to that first paper that I showed you about residency patterns in Sarasota Bay, the map on the left is of Freeze Brand 54, FB 54. She's our oldest dolphin in Sarasota Bay right now. She was born the year after our program started. We got to know her in 1975. You can see indications of her sightings over the decades in this map with different colors depicting different decades of the program and see that her range really hasn't changed much over that time. And she's representative of many of the animals we have. The community has been pretty stable in terms of the range that it's occupied over time. We've seen generation after generation of dolphin born into the area. At times we have as many as five concurrent generations. We've documented six generations over the course of the research in the area. The community is stable in terms of its home, our backyard. In terms of numbers, it's actually increased. Back in 1981, we published a number of 102 individuals that were present in the 1970s. When we started doing regular surveys in 1993 and have continued them on a monthly basis over time, what we've seen is that there's been a growth of the number of animals using the bay since 1993. There was, were peaks in growth when the net ban window went into effect and there were more fish present in the bay. There have been declines following red tides and cold events. But overall, we've seen a general increase of the number of animals using the bay. Some of this has come about because we engage in interventions. When there's a dolphin in trouble, NOAA asks us to help with Moat Stranding Investigations Program to rescue those animals and remove the gear that's a problem for those animals and give them life. So for example, the, the four mother calf pairs that are here in this photograph, three of those mothers benefited from interventions in which we were involved, and all those calves benefited from those interventions as well. So we'd like to think that the dolphins in Sarasota Bay are on a positive trend. As we indicated before, there's still a lot of things that are out there that are threats to them that we need to learn more about, and we need to figure out how we can go about mitigating those things. But that's what the next 50 years are for. I want to thank all of you for what you've done so far to make a difference for us and allowing us to get to this point in our research program. Hi, I'm Lori Swacky. I'm Chief Scientist for the National Marine Mammal Foundation. Prior to coming to the foundation four years ago, I worked for NOAA for 16 years, and I actually started collaborating with Randy and the Sarasota Dolphin Research Program uh, even prior to that. It was in 1999, when I was a grad student, that I met Randy at a Marine Mammal Commission workshop on marine mammals and persistent contaminants. I'd been reading lots of literature. My academic program was in biostatistics and I didn't know much about biology. So I was researching all I could on marine mammal biology. And there was a lot in the literature and I, much of it was on this population of dolphins in Sarasota, Florida. So when I met Randy, I immediately recognized his name and I was in awe of this person who had contributed so much to our knowledge of marine mammal biology. It's now been over 20 years. I'm still in awe of Randy and all that SDRP has done and continues to do. 
It's given a solid understanding of dolphin biology, drivers for dolphin health, and how persistent contaminants that flow into the oceans from our coast affect upper trophic level marine wildlife. The Sarasota dolphins serve a critical role as a reference population for understanding the impacts, of not just persistent chemical pollutants, but other chemical, biological, and physical stressors that many populations face. So thank you so much, SDRP, and congratulations on your 50th anniversary. Hi, my name is Peter Tyak, and I've worked with SDRP since 1984. I've attended most of the health assessments since that time. And I've had many students and postdocs who've done work on acoustic communication, echolocation, and particularly signature whistles of bottlenose dolphins in the Sarasota population. The SDRP's study of individual dolphins, where individual animals have been marked and their history has been tracked for so many generations, provides a critical setting for studying individual specific communication like signature whistles. It has also made a significant contribution to studying the impact of recreational vessel approaches in terms of disturbance reactions on bottlenose dolphins in a heavily settled area like Sarasota Bay. Hi, my name is Gretchen Lipwell. I'm the Stranding Investigations Program Manager at Moat Marine Lab. I first met Dr. Wells as a student in 1999 and began participating regularly with the program in 2002. In 2009, I moved to Sarasota and became a permanent resident where I get to partner daily with the amazing work that the Sarasota Dolphin Research Program does. We are the only place in the world where we can get a full look at a dolphin's life from cradle to grave across generations. The ability to ask questions about how the environment impacts these animals, how humans are affecting these animals is an amazing asset, not only to our local dolphins, but dolphins around the world. Thank you so much for your efforts for dolphins, conservation, and science. We appreciate you and here's to many, many more years. Hello, I'm Frances Gulland, Commissioner with the US Marine Mammal Commission, and congratulations on your 50 years anniversary. I just have a little something to say to you guys. There once were some dolphins in a bay who were happy swimming to pass the day, until along came a team of scientists with a dream to develop studies and give these animals a say. Thus followed 50 years of photos and captures and the lives of these dolphins cause raptures, not just in Sarasota, but all the world over, providing data for papers, theses, and lectures. From impacts of boat traffic and oil to new tag design and how darts recoil, the dolphins provided, albeit expertly guided, opportunities for fine research and toil. These dolphins continue to swim, but elsewhere conditions are grim. From Cambodia to Brazil, other dolphins fall ill, but the lessons from Sarasota stop hopes dim. Thanks for all of this information, Andy, and all these incredible testimonials uh, that you've had. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I am excited to be part of uh, not just the Chicago Zoological Society, but also, of course, of your program. Uh, we're proud of 30 years of involvement. Uh, that will go on into the future. Uh, I will be uh, 50 years from now, 115 years old, so I may not be around for that celebration. I'm sure you will be, however. Uh, as a conservation scientist, I know what it takes to do the sorts of things that you do. I know what it takes in terms of mental energy, in terms of the acumen of all of your staff and all the people who work with you. Uh, this kind of long-term study is immensely valuable, as uh, the last speaker said, uh, because a baseline study of marine mammals uh, in the field uh, with the amount of data you have of all the different relationships they have and all of that is, uh, is remarkable, uh, remarkable. There are very, very few long-term studies, as I mentioned last time. Um, you know, the other part of this, which makes Chicago Zoological Society really excited, uh, is that you focus on people and the people-animal interactions there. Uh, and right now, 87% of American public lives in highly urbanized, highly urbanized uh, conditions where they don't get to see wildlife. So, uh, in any case... Uh, this is an opportunity for us to teach people down there in uh, Florida, but also to teach people in the Chicago area 
about dolphins, and we use your data to do that. Uh, making that, making it personal, getting people to go from caring about dolphins to really caring for dolphins. That is where you guys step in down there, and that's what we do up in the Chicago Zoological Society. It's about the story of the animals. It's about what hap happens to animals in the field. Uh, and it's about the fact that right now on land mammals, uh, unlike uh, marine mammals, uh, only 5% of the world's land mammal biomass right now is wildlife. About 32% are human beings, and the rest of 63% is livestock. So people don't realize this because they don't understand animals, they don't understand the wild, and we're increasingly divorced from that. Zoos and your project and other projects that are able to tell the stories of these animals and bring those home as conservation stories for people is gonna be the future of conservation in this country, but also around the world. So thank you for having such a global reach. Thank you all and all of your incredible staff for doing what you do. Thank you very much, Stuart. Thanks for making it possible for us to do this. We really appreciate it. And with that, we've come to the point where the folks out there in video land get to have their say. And we have some questions that have come in. And uh, let me have a go at those. So one of the first question is, what's the most important thing we can do to help dolphins? Most important thing that you can do to help dolphins is to consider the fact that they have to make their living in the water. Be a great steward of the environment that you're in. When you're out boating, when you're out fishing, when you're out near the water, make sure that you're taking care of that environment so that the dolphins can thrive in it and so that we can continue to, to enjoy it or to make a living off of it for many, many years into the future. But recognize that these dolphins don't have any other place to go. This is their home. What we do to their home stays in their home and we need to make sure that they've got a decent place to live. A second question, how has the pandemic affected our work? It's affected us quite a bit, actually. We've not had an in-person meeting of our staff since back in February, but we've been able to work around things. My field team, led by Aaron Barleycorn, has come up with protocols for being able to allow us to get out on the water and continue to do our work. Our monthly monitoring of the Sarasota population has continued. We were continued at Essential Environmental Monitoring Service, and so we were able to go out, even when things were shut down otherwise, to continue to monitor the dolphins in Sarasota Bay and to be able to collect samples from those individuals over time and to continue our fishing operations. We make sure we do it in the most safe way. The people have to have masks on when they're out there. They have to maintain distance. They don't share equipment at all. And they've got different quadrants of the boat that they work in so that we can operate in the most safe way possible. They work in teams. They alternate when they come into the office to get their gear to go out to their boat so there's very little overlap between people. So thanks to our lab manager and our field coordinator, we've been able to keep things going and keep it going safely. In terms of how it's affected the dolphins, that's a good question. I touched on that a bit. In many other parts of the world, there's been indications that the pandemic has been of benefit to wildlife because there's so much less human activity going on out there. Wild animals are showing up in urbanized areas where they haven't been seen in quite a while or engaging in behaviors that haven't been seen in quite some time. In Sarasota, we had the opposite situation. It seems like we've seen increased human activity in the waters, which has perhaps had adverse impacts on the local dolphins. Again, we need to make sure we recognize that these animals have a home that they can live in safely, where they can thrive, and continue to make all those babies that I talked about. Another question. What got me interested in sharks and dolphins to start with? It was something that I couldn't do in Peoria, Illinois, where I grew up and I could do here. Um, this was a situation that's only partly in jest. I was very fortunate that my family moved to Florida when I was in high school. And up in Illinois, when I'd been growing up in high school and even before, I'd had a strong interest in the marine environment. My interest was primarily in sharks, but I got my break when I was able to come to work with Blair Irvine when I was a volunteer in high school at Moat Marine Laboratory, and I got the best of both worlds. I got to help on a project that looked at the behavioral interactions of sharks and dolphins, and I got to go out with Blair as he began the tagging project that became the program that we have now. 
Would I explain the SDRP logo? Sure, that's the, the little circle inside the 50 that you see up in the top of the slide. Um, I don't actually, that slide isn't up right now, but it will be. This was put together by one of our Earthwatch volunteers who was a, a professional designer. And it was meant to rep represent an engineering drawing. And it, it shows the, uh, shows that the, a dolphin that's unfinished, showing that we've not completely learned everything that needs to be learned about these animals, but we're approaching it from a very scientific perspective and trying to collect solid information about them. All right. And the final question that I have is, are there any specific things about the dolphins that surprise you most? One of the things that has surprised me the most over the years is that in spite of all the human activity along the coastline, during the time that I've lived here, since 1969 in Sarasota, the number of people to the number of boats have nearly quadrupled. In spite of all of that, in spite of all the habitat changes, the dolphins are still here. FB 54, the map that I showed at the end, she's still here and she's raised her kids here. These animals have a lot of flexibility. There's a limit to it. I hope we never get to that limit, but I've been pleasantly surprised that they have been able to carry on and keep their societies going generation after generation. And hopefully things are going to turn around in terms of the quality of the environment and make it a better place for them and for us as well. And late breaking questions coming in, okay. Uh, will the video be available? And it will be. It'll be on our website. Once it gets fully processed, it'll be there, and we'll send out a notice about how you can access it. But at this point, I'd like to thank all of you, and I'd like to thank the people that helped put together the program today. Front Page Productions was fantastic in putting this all together for us. There was no way we could have done this without them. Our volunteer, Renee Burskoff, helped prepare the videos and animations. Our staff and interns put an awful lot of effort into compi compiling the images and the data we used. And the two interns that I talked about before, Kaylin and Isabella, prepared the academic kelp and the publication word clouds. You've seen some amazing videos from wonderful colleagues from around the world. These are very busy people. Everybody's been more busy since the pandemic got started. And yet they took the time out to be able to produce these videos and contribute them to us. Preparation for this in terms of getting the word out about it uh, comes from Nadine Slimak of Vetted Communications and Martha Wells of Conservation Communications, helping to get the, the public relations aspect of things down here in Florida taken care of. Up in Chicago, the folks that we work for up there, the wonderful members of our overall team with Stuart and Sarah Breen Bartecki, Cindy Ziegler and Melissa O'Brock, and Leah Rippa and Sandy Katzen. All of these folks have helped to make today a success and as this is the kickoff of our 50th anniversary through the Chicago Zoological Society, you'll be hearing more from them and about them as we continue to talk about our program over the next year of celebration. And of course, I have to thank the Dolphins of Sarasota Bay. Without them, none of us would have been here today. And thank you all for coming. Take care. <laughs>